Amen. Revelation chapter 3 this morning. Everybody settle down now. Get your Bibles. Look at some of these Scriptures with me this morning. And I'd like to preach to you, of course, as you probably expected, on the rapture of the church. Um, you missed a Sunday school lesson. You missed a real blessing. I thought it was my brother John was getting into it and it was just growing and growing and growing. And I always thought a trumpet was going to sound, but it was a bell that rung. Uh, when that bell rung, I said, that don't sound much like a trumpet. But one day a trumpet is going to sound. It really is. Now, we don't have time to study all the book of Revelation this morning, but just to quickly show you what the book of Revelation is talking about, the book of Revelation basically shows you three things. And that outline is given around the chapter there, things which were, things which are, and things which shall be hereafter. The book of Revelation shows you things that happened during the church age, which we're in right now. The book of Revelation shows you things that's going to happen during the tribulation, the great tribulation, and then uh, here, hereafter. Now, since John wrote the book of Revelation, from that point of view, the Holy Spirit giving him the words to say, we can see where we fit. The way to understand the Bible is just like a road map. If you can find out where you are on the map, then you can find out how to get where, where you're wanting to go. You can hold a map upside down, it's not going to do you any good. There's a bunch of Marians. You know, there's like a Marion, Illinois, and there's a Virginia, and there's a Marion, South Carolina. You can just point you on the map and say, well, here's Marion, now let's go this road. You may be in the wrong Marion. You've got to get Marion, North Carolina to be, to be right. Pinpoint your location. Then Highway 70 goes that way. Highway 40 goes that way. 221 goes that way. Or 226 goes that way. South. 221 south. Highway, the old Highway 70 goes out here. Uh, then you can know what direction you're in. Give me, let me give you an example right now. Let's we'll see how many people know direction. On the count of three, I want you to point toward California. One, two, three. <laughs> California's big, you know it. It's that way and that way and that way and that way. Well, it, it is this way. That's west. Right? Alright? Point toward the Atlantic Ocean on the count of three. One, two, three. There you go. I need just something you look around to see which way everybody else is pointing. Then you look around. Now, the way you know that's because you're on the map. See, the Atlantic Ocean's that way, the Pacific Ocean's that way, and up yonder's Michigan, and down there's Florida, and Georgia's over here. And uh, that, that's because, you know why I know that? Because I know where I am. you got to know where you're at. You want me to show you where you're at in the Bible? You want me to show you where you are in the Bible? You're in Revelation chapter 3. You are in Revelation chapter 3 right now. Now, I won't be able to get into all of this this morning, but basically look at it. Basically, there are seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3. Each one of those churches represent an age of church history. Church history, as we know it, lasts around 2,000 years. Start on the day of Pentecost and up until the day we're living in right now. 1600, 1700, 1800. There are seven churches. Everybody listening? Listen. Look at it. Listen. This is very important. There is seven churches. You are in the last one. That The church age you and I are living in is verse 14. Right where you are in the book of Revelation is chapter 3 and verse 14. Under the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Right. That church of Laodicea. That word, Laos, means la the laity, Decea, the people. It simply means the rights of people. Civil rights. You are in the day when the church is... The, the day that the church is living in when all people are concerned about is I have my rights. I have my rights. I have my rights. I, want, I deserve this. I deserve that. The government owes me a living. We owe this. We do that. We do that. You know, but, uh, I don't want to preach on that, but it's just hard not to hit it as I go by. Uh, it, uh, listen, brother, the government, I mean, the government can't give you what they don't first take from you. Government don't have an endless supply to you. They ain't got nothing except what we give them. Somebody's got to work somewhere and give them money, and then they give it to people that won't work a lot of times. The Bible said if a man won't work, that man should not eat. That's why the unemployment rate is so low in China and places like that. That's right. Don't have time to get off on all of that, but we are concerned about civil rights. Civil rights. Look at verse 15. Here we go. This describes our, our generation. All right, boys, settle down now. 
Sit down. Find your seat. Sit down. There you go. Fifteen. Uh, I'm not. I'm not mean. I'm trying to keep y'all from being mean. Verse fifteen. I know thy works. Here's a picture of the church in the last days. Church in the last days. Ready? Verse fifteen. I know thy works that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou work cold or hot. See, they do just enough for God so you can't really say they're cold. But they're so far from God that you can't say they're hot. They're just somewhere in the middle. They go to church, live a good, decent life, don't really get on fire for God, but they don't really go back out and sin either. Is that a picture of our day? Is that a picture of our day? The average church is lukewarm. Now, I drink water. And sometimes I'm fasting, I'll drink hot water. Hot water. Just a hot glass of water. That's good for you. I ain't crazy over it. But I like cold water. I like cold water and I can stand hot water. But I can't stand lukewarm water. If I had my choice drinking, I'd drink it hot or cold. But water, sometimes when I go preach, they'll have me a glass of water and it's been sitting there two or three days. The preacher drunk out of it Sunday and I, and, and I just about reached down in it and get me something and throw it at myself. So I went to drink after him. And do you know something? I can't stand lukewarm water. Lukewarm. Room temperature. And that's what the Lord's saying here. He said, I know you work. You're neither hot, cold or hot. I would thou art cold or hot. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold one. So then, because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Verse 17. This describes our church day that we're living in. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing. Now listen, everybody listen. That's a picture of the modern day church. They have more stained glass windows, more money in the bank, nicer buildings, carpet, chandelier, all these things. But the Lord said, And knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, naked. Ah, what, what a picture of the church. Verse 19, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous therefore and repent. Verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. We use that as a picture of salvation. We use that as a picture... I don't know what in the world that was. That shows we're in the last days too. Uh, uh, We use that as a picture of salvation, but really it's not. Really it's not. That is a picture, literally, of Jesus Christ knocking at the church trying to get in. That is a sad picture of church in the 20th century. The Lord's outside the door knocking, trying to get in. You know as well as I know, if the rapture came today, that a lot of churches could carry on business as usual next week and even be in there. He hadn't been there in so long, they'd never miss Him. Amen? Boy, it's, I want to go to church where the Lord is. I want to go to church where the Lord is welcome in the services. Not only welcome, but in charge of what went on. He said this, he said, I stand at the door and knock. And then he goes on and on and on. Verse 22, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. Chapter 4, verse 1. We are at the bottom of chapter 3. Just like you're Mary in North Carolina on the map, in the Bible, you are in the last part of chapter 3. And here's what's coming next. Chapter 4, verse 1. Chapter 4, verse 1 says, After this I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. There's the picture of what's going to happen next. Jesus Christ said, I am the door. A door was going to be opened in heaven. Two times in the book of Revelation, a door is open. One time, somebody goes up through it. The second time, somebody comes down through it. That's the revelation. Here in this chapter, we see the rapture. And the first voice I heard was as it were of a trumpet. There's your trumpet's going to sound. Talking with me. This trumpet's one of them signs that can go wow, 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 and speak out your name, man. And it's going to come out like this, and the Lord's going to have the, tr- the, the angel blow the trumpet. We do not know who's going to blow the trumpet. All the gospel songs say Gabriel is. The only problem with that is the Bible doesn't say Gabriel is an archangel. The Bible says Michael is an archangel. Now, he might be, but it don't say that he is. I don't know where they get this. I think it's because Gabriel announced his first coming. They take for granted that Gabriel announced his second coming. Maybe he will. But we don't know that for sure. As one old preacher said, Gabriel's going to toot 
and we're going to scoot. Amen? That's right. Now, I don't know exactly who's going to blow it, but there's going to be a great shout from heaven, and the angel's going to go, da 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 and an angel's voice, trumpet's going to talk with you. And if you're saved, it'll say your name, and it will say, Come up hither. Now that happens right after this seventh church age. We know where we are this morning on the map. We know where we are on God's calendar. We don't just open it up in Ezekiel and say, uh-oh, there's me. No, there's you right there. Revelation chapter 3 and the last few verses. We are at the door. The next greatest miracle since the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Folks, the next hour on God's clock. The next check on God's checklist is the rapture of the church of Jesus Christ. We are going to leave this world with a shout and the voice of the archangel. Brother John covered it very very good by the word rapture and how it isn't mentioned in the Bible. The word simply means to be caught up. Now, if you understand your Bible, you will understand that the second coming of Christ is in two parts. Let's say this morning, boy, them looks good, don't they? Uh, but we're going to have a nicer than that when we get to glory one of these days. But let's just say to, uh, this morning that this apple right here represented the rapture of the church. Then we could say this apple right here represented the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. The second coming of Christ is in two parts. Let's say we're going along down here. We're going on our average, everyday job, you know, going to school, going to work, going whatever and all of this. We're right here. Where we are on God's calendar, we're right here. Here they are 2,000 years ago. The church age comes up through there. First, second, third, fifth, sixth, seventh. We are right here in Revelation chapter 3. We don't know how much time is between here and there. But whenever we get to right here, the trumpet will sound and we're going up to meet the Lord. Now when that happens, while we're up there at the judgment seat of Christ, there's going to be a period from this apple to that apple of at least seven years that the Bible calls the tribulation. It's divided into... A half, three and a half over here, three and a half over there. And during this three and a half is when the mark of the beast will be implemented and the Antichrist will rule the world with 666. I don't know if you've noticed it. I, while I was in Michigan this week, I was in the pastor's home. They had the news on TV. Uh, the president was on there giving a speech. And uh, he said something like this. He said, uh, and move toward a global economy. Have you noticed you hear that over and over and over now? Now that's what's going to happen after the rapture. When he holds up that little card and said, we're all Americans going to have a health care card and everybody's going to be on the same system, a global economy, that will be in place for the Antichrist to rule the world. Now the, the politicians don't know that, or if they know it, they're at least ignoring it. I don't know if they do or not, but we know one thing, this world is headed toward a dictatorship in which the Antichrist will rule over. Now the reason we know we are close to the apple is because we already see those things in place. You see the world setting up on a number system. You see cash slowly fading out. Everybody's wanting to do business with cards and numbers and, uh, and uh, barcodes and all of these things. It shows how close we're getting to the rapture. This thing could happen at any day. It could happen at any moment. We are in the last few seconds and days and hours and weeks before the Lord comes back. What if the Lord come back today? It could happen, my friend. It could happen. And if you're here and you're not right with God, you can be left behind. You're not, you'll be left behind. Wouldn't that be a nightmare if you just heard me preach on this this morning and then all of a sudden that blast sounded this afternoon and the Lord come and took His children out of this world and you would be left to face the most terrible time that the world has ever seen called the tribulation? Well, I'm telling you, it's going to happen. Some fellow wrote a book some time ago and he was teaching opposite from what I'm telling you this morning. He was teaching that the church will not be raptured out, that it will go to great tribulation. And I, start, I thought, well, I believe I'll see what he's got to say. And I picked up his book and I read a little bit. And the name of it is Christians Will Go Through the Tribulation. I read a little bit of it and he's, he began his illustration. His number one illustration started out with Noah. Here we see by the story of Noah that God did not 
take Noah out of the world at, at, when the flood came or before the flood came. He said God put Noah in the ark and preserved Noah and took him through the flood. And that's a picture of how you and I will go through the great tribulation, see the Antichrist, mark of the beast and everything. Now you have a pretty good argument there if you don't read the Bible very much. It might sound a little bit convincing. I thought, well, he's got a pretty good argument there. But I said, that boy missed something. He missed something very, very important. You see, Noah going through the, tr- the flood is in Genesis 6 and Genesis 7 and Genesis 8 and he threw it there in chapter 9. He forgot one very important character in Genesis chapter 5. And in Genesis chapter 5, there's an old boy by the name of Enoch. And the Bible said that Enoch was the seventh from Adam. That's not by accident. And the Bible says that Enoch walked Amen. Enoch walked with God. He was the seventh from Adam. We're the seventh church. Second Adam. And the Bible said, oh, Enoch was walking with God. And then all of a sudden, one day, before that flood hit, Enoch disappeared. Just vanished. I mean to tell you, brother, it's just right now you see me. Like that, boy. I mean, what was his own? Just like that. I mean to tell you, he disappeared. And the Bible said he was not. Somebody got to looking for old Enoch and somebody went downtown and they said, where's Enoch? And they said, "Uh, he's not. And they said, what do you mean he's not? He said, he's not. They said, what do you mean he's not? Not. And he just said, that's all God told us. He's just not. And they said, that's not even a sentence. You can't make a sentence out of he's not. You better shut your mouth. God said it and He can make a sentence out of whatever He wants to. And the Lord said He's not. And they said, He's not what? He's not no around here no more. Uh, he, he's not nowhere to be found. Amen. He's gone, man. He's gone. He's gone. He's gone. His troubles are over. He's with the Lord. Enoch is a picture of a man who lived in this world and never died to picture those that will die. I've heard people say, well, what about Hebrews 9 27? That said it's appointed a man wants to die. And they take that verse and try to make Enoch one of the two witnesses that will come back in Revelation chapter 11 and die and make it Enoch and Elijah because Enoch and Elijah didn't die. That won't work at all. That won't work at all. Hebrews 9.27 is not a doctrinal statement. There's an exception to Hebrews 9.27 and Enoch is one of them. Enoch don't come back in Revelation 11 and die. That's a picture of Moses and Elijah in and, and Revelation chapter 11. And, and, and Elijah does come back and die. And brother, he comes back and dies. Moses comes back and dies the second time. Some people in the Bible die twice. But Lazarus died twice. The widow of Nain's son died twice. Dorcas died twice. All the people that Jesus is the dead died twice. He's pointing a man once to die is not a doctrinal statement for which there are no uh, exceptions. Enoch is a picture of the Christian who's alive when the Lord comes back, who's caught up to heaven and never dies. Jesus told it to Mary Martha when He said, He that believeth in Me, though He were dead, uh, shall he live. And uh, who that liveth and believeth in Me shall never die. That's a picture of the rapture. The rapture of the church. The rapture is in two parts. The first part of it, He comes for His saints. The second part, He comes with His saints. He comes down here to rule and reign with His saints. This is where the Lord comes. Revelation 19.11 is where this apple pops in. Right here. You read Revelation 19.11 and everything between chapter 4 verse 1 and chapter 19 verse 11 happens between them two apples right there. That's the mark of the beast. That's the antichrist. That's the great tribulation. We're up here getting the wrinkles ironed out of our wedding garment. We get up on our white horses and brother, here we crack down with the Lord. Just like this, riding our white horses. You say, I'm scared of horses. You won't be scared of these horses. They won't hurt you. You'll have a glorified body if you fell off. You'd just ricochet off the planet somewhere and ride, jump right back on your horse. And brother here, you'd come right back down, huddle in rain with the Lord. That's why the old timey preachers used to say that we're going to leave like Superman and come back like the Lone Ranger. Hallelujah. Amen. Brother, one of these days this thing's going to happen. That's right. Amen. We're going to we're going to go and the boss. We're going to suffer our loss, eat our supper, and crawl on our halls and come back 
one day and rule with the Lord. That's what's going to happen for the child of God. Listen, if there wasn't no hell, I'd be glad I'm saved this morning because I'm going to miss that terrible period as the great tribulation. Jesus said, there never had been a time like this. No, nor ever would be. There's where the Bible said, woe unto them that are with child and them that get sucked in those days. There's where the Bible said, let them which be in Judea flee to the mountains. There's what the Bible means when it said, when you see the abomination of desolation, spoke of Daniel the prophet, it's right here. Smack in the middle of the tribulation when the Antichrist goes in, sets down, and proclaims himself to be God. We, are, we see all these types in the Word of God. It goes like this. The Lord comes here. We go up to meet Him here. Everything's breaking loose down here. The world is fighting wars, famines, troubles while we're up here. Then we come back down here with Him to watch Him rule and take over this world. Now, turn your Bible to Revela- uh, uh, Luke chapter 12. Just a second. And I'll show you just one verse of Scripture. While you're turning there, let me quote you some verses of Scripture. Here um, in Zechariah 14, 5, the Bible said, The Lord shall come and all the saints with Him. 1 Thessalonians 3.13 The Bible said, Establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with His saints. He comes for the saints there. He comes with the saints there. It's plain laid out in your Bible. You're looking at Luke chapter 12. Now look at Luke chapter 12 and verse 36. I don't know, maybe I don't quote it exactly right, but it says something like, And you yourselves watching, something like that, waiting for the Lord to come, when He shall return or come, what? From the wedding. You looking at that? Look at Luke chapter 12, verse 36. When He shall return from the wedding. Those men were told to keep their lamps trimmed and burning and everything so that when the Lord come back from the wedding, that they'd be ready. Now, whoever he's talking to there, when the Lord comes after them, he's already married. You see that in your Bible? You see that? There's your second part of the second coming. We go to meet the Lord here. We're His bride. We get our wrinkles ironed out of our dress. We have our, our wedding. Then we come down here for our honeymoon. He comes from the wedding. See? He could come back from the wedding at the rapture. Because he can't get married till his bride gets there. A man ain't going to get married till his bride comes in. That'd be a weird wedding. Of course, nowadays they have a few like that where they ain't like. But I promise you they ain't a funny bone in the Lord's body. Man, he's straight. He's not crooked. That's the opposite of straight, crooked. They call it gay, we call it crooked. And I'm telling you, brother, listen, the Lord said He's coming. He's coming. He's coming. Now I'm telling you this, uh, this morning, ladies and gentlemen, the Bible said, be ready. Jude chapter 14, or verse 14, I'm sorry, said, behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of His saints. And I'm telling you, He's coming with saints one of these days. Quickly this morning, let me say a few things about the rapture. Oh, I wish I had time to give you all of these things this morning, but there's no way I could give you all of it. I'd already spit out so much here about, you know, while you're thinking about one thing, I'm three sentences gone down the road, but I'm trying to give you a lot, but you have to slow down enough to where you can understand what I'm saying. But listen, I want to say one thing about the rapture. The rapture will be a surprise. The Bible said He'll come as a thief in the night. Rapture, wouldn't you agree this morning that the people in this world not looking for the Lord to come back? But is that an understatement or what? Do you believe that people out there, you know what people remind me of nowadays? People, Lord, come back now. People's not ready to meet Him. They'd be like that guy, they'd be like that fellow went out to the drive in theater one night, one of them old timey drive ins. Boy, he got out there, you know, and he got on there and he got, he got the microphone and he got out there and he said, all right, you dirty crook. He said, I'm in here and I got my shotgun. And I, right now, you're out there with my wife and I'm going to come out there and I'm going to blow your blankety blank head off right now. And about 43 cars left out of the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, that's the way people are, see? But people ain't looking for the Lord. Look up here now. Look at me. We're not praying yet. I'll tell you when it's time to bow your head. You know how people's living nowadays. You know the average person is not ready.
ready to meet the Lord. You know, listen, there's some of you people right here this morning, you know good and well, your life's not right with God. You're not ready to meet Jesus. I'm here to preach to you this morning, telling you He's coming. He's coming. It's going to be a surprise. He's coming without warning. He's coming as a thief in the night. There, there are five basic things that happens uh, to describe a thief in the night. The Lord didn't say thief in the night just to have something to say. He was giving you a comparison. Let me give you these five things right quickly. Number one, a thief does not announce his coming. Isn't that right? Now you ought to be able. You, can you figure that out? I mean, the guy don't call you up one day and say, uh, "Yes, uh, is this Mr. Jones?" Yes, sir. Well, uh, I just want you to know that I've got a U-Haul truck and I'm going to come over about two o'clock in the morning and and rip you off, steal everything in your house. Thief don't do that. A thief does not announce his coming. You don't know he's coming. What be a crazy? You, you say, "Well, I know somebody that says they know when the Lord comes back." Well, they're just deceived. Nobody knows when the Lord's coming back. We know the times and the seasons. We know we're getting close. But nobody knows the day a thief does not announce his coming. Let me say something else. Number two, a thief comes for a certain purpose. A thief comes over to your house. He's coming in. You say, where'd you learn how to do that? <laughs> Why? Well, I've never, never broken nobody's house, but I think about it sometimes, you know? Sometimes I think, I think uh, not that I want to do it or anything, but I always think like if I was, I guess that's awful of me thinking like that. But have you ever been in a store or Walmart or something and you say, my goodness, I could just walk out with this and nobody would never know it. I don't want to steal. I don't believe in stealing. I don't steal. But sometimes I think stuff like that. When I go to jail to preach and everything, I'm, the whole time I'm in there I think, now how could I get out of here? I could go over here and I could make a big loud noise over here and the guards are looking and I could jump over the fence and I'm, I'm, I'm just, I don't know why I think like that. I'm always thinking of some way I could escape if something was to happen. But anyway, thief comes over to your house. See? He's after something. He's coming for a purpose. I mean, a thief don't come over and say, uh, where's your remote control at, man? I'm going to stretch out your couch, you know, watch a little TV. Got anything to eat? You know, that ain't why a thief comes. He comes for a purpose, see? He's after something. He's after something. When Jesus comes in the rapture, He's coming for a purpose. He's coming for a purpose. Number three, a thief does not take everything in the house. Is that right? Just the jewels, gold, and precious things. I mean, a thief don't come to your house and, and, and you know, go in there and start getting trash bags up, you know, and getting out of all, all the trash and putting them little tie things on there and twisting it up. A no, thief don't do that, does he? He sneaks in the bedroom, you know, opens the drawer, starts looking in here. He says, boy, I'll find me something in here. There's a watch. Man, there's a diamond ring. Something. He's after that. He's after that. And I want to say to you this morning, ladies and gentlemen, when the Lord comes back, He ain't, he ain't coming for everybody. He's not coming for every Tom, Dick, and Harriet goes to church on Sunday morning. You say, well, would I be ready when the Lord comes? I don't know, would you? The old folks used to say, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. Will He call your name if He comes today? Listen, if I was here this morning and I didn't know that I was saved down the shadow of a doubt, I wouldn't even, when I got through preaching, I'd be down here at this altar saying, God, have mercy on me. I want to be ready when Jesus comes back. You see, it's too late, boy. He can come and be gone just like that. Number four, He does not come to stay. They don't. As soon as he gets what he's after, he's gone. As a matter of fact, at the rapture, his feet ain't even going to touch this ground. He's coming in the clouds and we're going to go to meet him. It's just like he stuck a big magnet out here. And everybody that's saved got something inside you that responds to that magnet. Right out through that black hole, man, they found up north. And that's the way he's taken us. Number five, a thief leaves much more than he takes. You see, that's why a lot of times when you come home, you can't even tell your house has been broke into. Boy, isn't that a point? Isn't that a thought? Most a lot of people, you can come home, you might not even know you've been robbed a day or two later. You get to looking for your, your pistol, or you get to looking for your, uh, you know, your, a, a special ring. Or something. You say, God, somebody's been, been in here and stole this stuff. That's how it's going to be at the rapture. 
the average person won't even realize it's happened. Now, around this part of the country, there's a lot of saved people. Brother, it's going to create a stir. There's going to be maybe plane wrecks and car wrecks. and I mean, can you imagine driving down the interstate bunch, and all of a sudden the Lord come back and everybody who's saved driving them cars just vanishes? And I mean, them things crack. Can you imagine? It's going to create a stir, buddy. The 911 calls are going to be coming in. They're going to be a national state of emergency. And by the way, that's what will set the stage for the Antichrist takeover. When all those things start happening, fires, lawlessness. You, t- you think that thing out there in Los Angeles... That Rodney King riots was something. That's not a drop in the bucket to what's going to happen. But it's going to be uncontrolled rioting and lawlessness according to the book of Revelation when the Lord comes back. A lot of people won't even know the jewels are gone. Will they call your name? Yesterday, I sat. Nine o'clock yesterday morning, I was sitting in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania waiting on airplane. And I, for some reason, I always, I'm home, but for some reason or another, I was real bad wanting to get home this time. Seemed like this week was a little bit longer than normal. And I hate hate being having to be gone like that. And it seemed like Thursday or Friday, I said, man, I want to go home. I want to see my wife. I want to see kids. I want to see the church. I want to see the, the, the Pittsburgh. I went up to the desk to check in. And they said, sir, I don't think you're going to get on. I said, why? He said, we're three overbooked on this flight. And he said, uh, I said, well, what do you think my chances are? He said, uh, I don't think you got much of a chance. I said, oh, no, man. When's the next one? He said, 15 to 12. They put me in Charlotte about uh, 10 to 1 or something like that. And I said, uh, come on, man. I want, I, want to, I want to go home. That big jet was sitting out there like a big silver bullet. So I went walking around there a little bit and I sat there and sat there and sat there and sat there. And, sat there. and finally they got on our uh, flight 1677 uh, to Charlotte, North Carolina. All passengers should be on board. And we just had to sit there, me and, a couple, me and four or five other people. We was on what's called standby. All them people got on that plane. And this is just a little picture of what I'm preaching about this morning. I got sitting there thinking that plane's headed out into the sky. I don't know if I'm going to get to be on it or not. He said, in just a moment, we'll be calling the names of the standby passengers that are going to play. And I said, Lord, I want to go home. Lord, if it could be your will, I sure would like to get home earlier the better. I don't even know if I'd be able to get on the next one. Lord, please let me go home. I want to see what's going on. I miss everybody. And I said, Lord, let me go home. And I sat there and sat there. And the guy said, all right, these standby passengers are coming. He went like this. He'd say, um, Hillings, Johnson, A, this. He started calling names. And I sat there. I thought maybe he's doing it in alphabetical order. He said, uh, Burley. Something. I said, maybe C's are next. C's are next. Then he went to somebody like Washburn. I'm like, no. These people went up and got him one time. I sat there. He got them on there and they said to see if any more have any more seats. He said, so and so, so and so, so and so, and my heart just started to sink. That's an awfulest feeling when you're waiting on your name to be called. What a feeling of just being left out. And he called three more names out. And he said, So and so, Castle. And then boy, my heart went just like that all the time. It just started bubbling. I said, oh, here I got my bag. And on I went. Man, I went in there and sat down. I had sat there with two stewardesses, man, all, all, all the way down there. And I wound up talking to them about the Lord. And one of them was over here in Black Mountain and said she might come down here to church. The other one going through family problems and stuff like that. But I tell you, I just wanted on. I just wanted on. I just wanted on. I thought how sad it would be for me to stand there and watch that thing go... Headed toward North Carolina if I wasn't. I'm going to tell you something one of these days, folks. This old ship right here is going to pull out. The most horrible thing in the world would be for you to sit here and say, No! What about me? No, God, I want to go! I want to go to heaven! Lord, don't leave me! And your name's not called. Your name is not called. 
If He come today, would He call your name? Really? Seriously? I'm, I'm talking to you. If He come today, would He call your name? Folks used to sing, I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening. I'll be somewhere listening for my name. That trumpet sounded this morning. stand with our heads back. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one talking, no one leaving. As God deals with our hearts this morning, I need to ask you a question. God spoke to your heart. If there's any doubt or mind Listen to me, teenagers. If there's any doubt in your mind that you'd be ready to go if Jesus come back today in the rapture. I wouldn't worry about what somebody said. I wouldn't worry about what somebody thought. I'd get out of my seat, take my way down here to this altar, and I'd say, Lord, I want to be ready to go. If you're not saved here this morning, you're, you're messing up. I'm telling you, every day you wait, you're taking a big change with your soul. We're going to pray and we're going to sing. I'm going to ask you this morning, many of you, many of you, some's already come this morning, I believe, at least one, maybe more. If God's speaking to your heart this morning and you're not right with the Lord. You're not saved here today. Let this be the glad day. I'm talking about men here. You say, I'm a grown man. I can't go to the altar in front of all these people. But it's not going to hurt you. Jesus wasn't ashamed to let Him beat His hands and feet for you in public. Now you shouldn't be ashamed. Step out for Him. Heavenly Father, Lord, I know You're coming one of these days. It might be today. Lord, forgive me. I want to be ready. Lord, I just felt yesterday at that airport just a little teeny bit how a person would feel if they got left behind. Lord, I could, I could get a bus. I could hitchhike. I could call somebody to come get me. I could borrow a car. I could rent a car. Something, Lord. I know I could have got home. And I was disappointed. I can't imagine how it would feel to be left behind when everybody else goes to heaven and never.